But it helps to, this story helps to illustrate how a party, a group, an organization, and so on, can turn around from its original idea or its original program, uh, unbeknownst to itself. And it, this little story took place in Japan over a period of two and a half centuries. It seems that way back around 1600, the Spanish tried to colonize Japan. And like all colonists, they do it with missionaries, among other things. And so they had their Christian Catholic missionaries going over there. And because of a lot of things that I won't go into now, religion has often played the role of a catalyst for revolution under certain conditions. And there was a tremendous rebellion that took place in Japan, happened to be called the Shimabara Rebellion, and its ideology was Catholicism. <laughs> now we're all familiar with Protestantism being the ideology of revolutions against the Catholic monarchy, but here it was against the Buddhist monarchy of Japan, against the Shogun, so-called, and it was a deep growing revolution for land, and the people just made a heroic effort, you know, to try to take over the land, and they did it in the name of Christianity. So after the Shogun put this down with the most brutal means he could, he then made Christianity illegal in Japan, and not only that, made it impossible for the Spanish or anybody else to come into Japan anymore. And for 250 years, Japan was known as the, uh, I forget the name of it, so the exclusive country anyway, where nobody could get in there. And <clears throat> in all this time, Christianity still existed, illegally and underground. And the people took great chances to be Christians. And they were, you know, sometimes caught for practicing their religion, and they were crucified, you know, really were, literally cru crucified very badly. They, were, they crucified them upside down where the tide was coming in, so they had the worst possible death as the water left into them. They both drowned and strangled and so forth and so on. That was a very, very tough thing, you know. Well, in 1868, when the capitalist revolution took place there, it's called the Restoration, but it was actually a capitalist revolution of sorts, they again allowed the foreigners in, and of course the Christian missionaries, you know, came in again, and they wanted to see their brothers and sisters in Christ, you know, and find out how they'd been doing, you know. Well, now you know, the primitive religion in Japan on the countryside is animism, nature worship and so forth, you know, that generally speaking, those who were not Christians were nature worshippers. Well, anyway, so up comes these Baptists and Methodists and whatnot, you know, Catholics and so forth, preachers all, and they're coming up and asking the, they, you know, Christianity has now surfaced again, it's legal again. So they ask these people who have taken their lives in their hands to be Christians, you know. They, they ask them, well, uh, how are you doing? Oh, it's great to be free again. We can practice our great Christian religion again. And then, do uh, you want to come to a service? And then they hold their secret, what had been a secret service. And a, a Methodists and Baptists and Catholics. They say, what is this? It seems that, that uh, Christ was a god of the moon, and, uh, and uh, St. Peter was a god of the wind, and uh, St. John was a god of the streams, and so forth and so on. So in other words, here they had been risking their lives for two and a half centuries for a religion which was in effect the same as the religion they were supposedly fighting. In other words, they had adapted themselves to the conditions that existed there. And, and they had just renamed with Christian forms what had been their more or less pantheistic uh, nature worship thing. See, in other words, it, that adaptation took place. So, so a, a Marxist party can exist in hostile conditions and even the people be, you know, pretty brave and uh, even self-sacrificing and everything, but unconsciously adapt themselves over a period of time 
until there's no longer anything left of the original uh, philosophy or teachings that they started out with, even though they're still using the same word. Well, that's given the SWP a lot of credit to say that they're really risking their lives like these poor Japanese peasants were, but it does illustrate how they could adapt, and especially through the Cold War, adapt and change their line, even though they were under the gun, and even though they were on the Attorney General's subversive list, and so forth. Now I want to talk to this time about the 20th Congress of the Communist Party in the Soviet Union and the so-called Khrushchev revelations and how that affected both the CP and the SWP. But before I do, I want to say one more word about another thing that happened in 1956, that same year, which uh, illustrates a little bit, too, how, how the SWP was looking at things and how, uh, how they saw the struggle. Just around that time and before, Martin Luther King started, or not only Martin Luther King, but uh, Rosa Parks and so forth, started this big movement of the Montgomery bus boycott that you've all heard about. That was the first, you know, one of the first big organized things in modern times was this bus boycott. That might not sound today like you know, like a rebellion or something, but it was very, very difficult in Montgomery, Alabama to, to do this, and they did it. And then there was a lot of other things happened at the same time. There was the Emmett Till lynching, and there were other murders and, and other uh, persecutions that hit the headlines in the North. Now, the SWP cooked up this idea that they got to have a new slogan, and uh, uh, to really dramatize the struggle. So they decided on the slogan, U.S. Troops to the South. U.S. Troops to the South. And they had this as a headline across the top of their paper <coughs> early in 1956. And what did that mean, U.S. Troops to the South? They were saying, in effect, that the U.S. government is going to rescue the, uh, the persecuted black people by going down there with U.S. troops. And, well, you know now that all the rebellions that happened, the U.S. troops came in and shot down the black people, right? But that was a few years later. Not many years, but just a few years later. Well, we counterposed to U.S. troops to the South. We said, that is our group, the Marcy group and the, the SWP said, no, 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 we should be for self-defense guards or anything but U.S. troops to the South. We don't want that. The U.S. troops, it's an imperialist army. We don't want that imperialist army going to the south. We don't want to ask for that. That's wrong. And we had a big fight, and they all voted against us on that. They all disagreed with us on that. This is all within the political committee, the national committee of the SWP, and they were all against it. But I, I just want to get that out of the way first because it's, it's so much like the CP. The CP has the same general approach. They call a cop. If the CP had been running that uh, Congress that we had in uh, Cobo Hall and the disruptions came, you know what the CP would have done. They'd have called the cops. Well, you know, the cops would probably have got rid of the disruption, all right. But, you know, it's like asking the cops for permission to have your revolution. You know, is it, well, the CP and the SWP both have this thing of having adapted so much to bourgeois legality that they go for stuff like that, you know and calling like for troops to the South. But let me go right into the question of the 20th Congress of the Soviet Communist Party and the so-called Khrushchev revelations, because they had an enormous effect on the Communist Party all over the world, particularly in the United States, and a special effect on the SWP. Now, these Khrushchev revelations came to us in the United States in two parts one in February 1956 and one in June. And the reason for that was it all took place in February, but there was a so-called secret speech that was not revealed in the United States until June, which I'll come to later. I'll just take the parts we heard about. What we heard was that, that in this 20th Congress, there was a big 
expose of the Stalin cult, the cult of the individual and so forth. And they said, look, we, this is not communist, this is not socialist, this is hero worship, individualism, uh, dictatorship of the individual and so forth. And this all came out. And it came out with a terrible shock to the Communist Party. And a lot of criticisms of Stalin that came out at that time. And there were, nobody could answer them. That's the point. See, today it's easy when you're not confronted with all these things to say, oh, well, that was an exaggeration, so on so on. But there was nobody that could answer anything they said about Stalin. So what happened was the members of the Communist Party, who at that time just <coughs> worshipped Stalin and thought Stalin was like Lenin, only more so. Because Lenin, you could criticize, you could argue, but you couldn't argue with Stalin. Nobody ever argued with Stalin. They just say the great Stalin and the great leader and the great this and that. Nobody could stand up and raise their hand for a question. Whereas Lenin, people could oppose him and did all the time, even after the Bolshevik Party conquered state power. But Stalin was a completely different situation, different case. And I won't go into the analysis of why right now point is that the members of the Communist Party saw it that way. And they not only thought that Stalin was perfect and could do no wrong, but to them, Stalin and the Soviet Union were one and the same thing. If Stalin was bad, the Soviet Union was bad. So they thought. So what happened was that they began to quit. There were 17,000 at the beginning of 1956. There were 17,000 members of the CP. And the first sign that something was wrong was they started to have great big open meetings, self-criticism meetings. And I went to, I was in New York at the time, and I went to all of them, and, uh, you know, anybody could get up and say things and so forth and so on, which was okay, democratic and everything, but they were, just didn't know what to say. You could see that the membership and leaders were completely on the defensive. Now, the SWP saw this as a great big move to the left in, in uh, the Soviet Union. They saw the move to the left. Why? Because it was breaking up this monolithic, undemocratic, unworkers democracy, democratic dictatorship that Stalin personally had, and it was opening the way, in their opinion, for genuine communists, they thought. And although Khrushchev was calling for peaceful coexistence, they had been criticizing Stalin for the last 10 or 15 years for also being for peaceful coexistence at the expense of the world proletariat. Because all Stalin's peaceful coexistence stuff was always, always had a harpoon in it. That, that basically it was for peaceful coexistence, but the only way he could get peaceful coexistence with capitalism was by modifying the fight, the international fight for socialism. But people forgot that because of the Cold War, Stalin got a reputation for being tough, which the SWP never even noticed, but everybody else forgot that Stalin had been so awful in the 30s and so conciliatory in the 30s and thought that because of the Cold War and the US and the imperialism's terrible attack on the Soviet Union, which Stalin had to oppose to some extent, they thought Stalin was the tough guy. So it, it appeared to the average person and the, and the U.S. imperialist correctly that when Khrushchev was calling for peaceful coexistence, he was moderating from the Stalin line. But the SRP couldn't see that because they said the Stalin line always was the same. So you remember our last week, our yesterday's discussion, that I said that they couldn't see that there had been any change at all from the 30s to the 40s, or from the wartime to the post-war time. They couldn't see there had been a change, but there had been a change. So that when Khrushchev was in effect really going back to the Stalin of the 30s in a way, back to the peaceful coexistence utopia with imperialism, and remember always that peaceful coexistence always implied, may not today quite so much, but at that time, 
It always implied sacrificing the world revolution in order to get a peaceful coexistence with imperialism. That was the implication. So when Khrushchev come out for this, uh, don't forget nobody else criticized it. The Chinese did not criticize it. The, the, the Communist parties of the world didn't criticize it. So when the SWP said, well, this is no change, well, it was difficult to point to any, for us to point to anything. <clears throat> also, Khrushchev, in that same speech that was publicized, I think, at the time, uh, came out against the dictatorship of the proletariat and s actually said, we don't want to have the dictatorship of the proletariat anymore. We want a democratic state of the whole people. Well, anybody that knows Marxism knows there's no such thing as a democratic state of the whole people. No, nowhere. Nowhere. A state, the Leninist theory of the state tells you that some class runs the state, right? Got to be either the working class or the capitalist class runs the state. It has the state. It's their state. Well, of course, we, the Marcy group, said, well, the mere fact that he says it's not the dictatorship of the proletariat doesn't make it not the dictatorship. We said it still is the dictatorship of the proletariat in spite of the fact that Khrushchev says it isn't. But nevertheless, at the same time that he's saying this, he has a purpose for saying it. The good side, let's say, was that he meant and he wanted, he signaled the people in the Central Committee and in the Congress, Soviet 20th Congress, he signaled them that, look, we're not going to have a personal dictatorship anymore, and we're going to have committee leadership, and your lives are safe. We're not going to lop your heads off one by one like Stalin did. Well, you know, that was, that moderated things, and they had committee management for a while. That was, let's say, the good side of Stalin's, or rather Khrushchev saying, that we're going to end the dictatorship of the proletariat. If you have given the benefit of the doubt that he was stupid about Marxism and only meant this in a typical bourgeois way, that the dictatorship of the proletariat was the dictatorship of Stalin, and that's not our view, <coughs> dictatorship of the proletariat is a class dictatorship which can be democratically done or dictatorially done or anything. It's the power of the working class. But that was far from Khrushchev's mind and far from the mind of the Soviet Communist Party because they unanimously voted for Khrushchev's report. In addition to this question of the dictatorship of the proletariat, however, Khrushchev also said that we're now for the peaceful road to socialism and not for revolution. Now, of course, Stalin had never said that, but he certainly wasn't very much for revolution either. I mean, from his record from 1923 or 4 to 1941, the time he was attacked by Hitler, he, uh, he never showed very much interest in proletarian revolution outside of the Soviet Union. But nevertheless, he never said that, you know, we can have the peaceful road will bring about socialism. So Khrushchev, in words at least, made a big step to the right by saying this. Now, I brought this up personally to a SWP leader and said, but look, Khrushchev is revising Lenin. And he said, oh, Stalin shot the Leninists, he said. I said, yes, he shot the Leninists, but he didn't revise Lenin. And not he didn't dare openly revise Lenin. Well, yeah, but that's a small point that uh, this is all, you know, so forth and so on. In other words, they thought this was, or tr said they thought, and seemed to think, that the words that Khrushchev used were not the important thing. It was the fact, again, that he was against Stalin and that made him a leftist. That was from their um, distorted point of view. And I, I think this carries out the same thought that I was showing in some other relationships yesterday. Now, where he was going, where was Khrushchev going? He was going towards a rapprochement with imperialism. Well, that didn't mean that Stalin didn't want a rapprochement with imperialism too, but Khrushchev was 
signaling to imperialism that he would give more to get this rapprochement. Now the CP not only was having all these meetings and was thrown for a loss, like I said, but they even had one great big meeting. And they were so disoriented, they were thinking not of uniting with the SWP, which the SWP kind of wanted. They wanted to unite with all the right wing of the CP, which I'll come to later. The CP, on the other hand, wanted to unite with somebody to the right of the SWP. Everybody was going to the right. The CP held a meeting at Carnegie Hall in New York with a symposium or debate between Eugene Dennis, who was then the National Secretary of the CP, and guess who? Norman Thomas. Now, Norman Thomas was, when he died, he was the head of the Socialist Party. When he died, a great big editorial in the New York Times saying, what a wonderful man, you know, what a fine fellow he was and everything. He was our socialist, you know, <laughs> our imperialist U.S. socialist. That was the guy who in 1956 had this, shared the platform with Eugene Dennis, and when Eugene Dennis said, let's get together and so forth, Thomas said, well, I don't see how we can have any unity right now between the Socialist Party and the Communist Party. Eugene Dennis took the floor and said, I'm glad that Comrade Thomas said, right now, so that maybe we'll still have that unity. That was back in 1950, but that's how demoralized and right-wing the CP was. So if you wonder why we didn't join, the uh, Marcy Group didn't join the CP, they said, yes, WP, that's kind of an answer. The CP was head over heels trying to go to the SP, the Socialist Party, which is the social democratic, you know, pro-imperialist bunch, where the SWP was still in the framework of Leninism, at least with the words, you know, even though they would shut their eyes to something in order to convince themselves that they could make this jump that they wanted to make that I mentioned. Now, in June of 1956, a new shock came, and this was the publication of the secret speech, so-called, that Khrushchev had made at the 20th Congress. Now, it was published first in the New York Times, verbatim, about four pages or something. Then the militant, the organ of the SWP, printed the site that verbatim. The next week, the Daily Worker, the organ of the CP, printed it verbatim. So everybody on earth knew that was political, knew what this secret speech said. And it was devastating, devastating. And it's never been repudiated. Nobody in the Soviet Union has ever repudiated it's called Salinist group. Nobody repudiated that <laughs> to this day that's 25 years later it still has not been repudiated now in that speech among other things Khrushchev showed how when Hitler attacked the Soviet Union it was totally unprepared how Stalin had bungled everything showed how Stalin had had chopped off all the generals, for instance. He didn't say that half the generals were Trotskyists, and that's why. But, I mean, generals who were brought up by the revolution. See, Trotsky was the head of the Red Army, you know. And uh, uh, Marshal Tukhachevsky, for instance, and General Blucher, or Marshal Blucher or something, were experienced generals and so forth. The Red Army was beheaded, and Hitler knew it. But Stalin had such paranoia, and Hitler showed I mean, not Hitler, uh, Khrushchev overdid it, I think, but he did, kept on emphasizing Stalin was crazy, Stalin was mad, and so forth. Well, of course, it was known that before he died, he was a little off because of the famous story about the doctor's plot. He claimed that 12 doctors that were attending him at his last sickness, that they were all conspiring to kill him. <laughs> and, and it was pretty hairy, and uh, I mean, his accusations were pretty hairy. And they finally reversed it and saved the lives of these doctors, but, but he was about to knock them off, too. But anyway, uh, 
it's forgotten sometimes in thinking of the heroism of the Soviet fight against Hitler, it's forgotten when they give all the credit to Stalin for being the leader of it, that 20 million people died. And if you put that side by side with the fact that Stalin was the leader, if Stalin was so great, what was so great about losing 20 million? In other words, uh, any general, if you give him enough soldiers, can win the battle, <laughs> you know. McClellan in the Civil War, you know, he was always telling Lincoln, give me some more soldiers and I'll win. And Lincoln couldn't give him enough, you know, couldn't give him all he wanted. But if he had enough and get enough killed, you know, he'd do it. And Grant finally did do just that. Grant went out and had his battles all over, but it's forgotten that General Grant, about half his armies got slaughtered. It's forgotten, but, but that's half of his genius was in getting everybody killed. Well, Stalin uh, was so caught flat-footed by Hitler, uh, and at the same time, he had been warned categorically. There was a, a, a Soviet spy in, uh, in Japan, a, a, a grandson of Sorge, the guy that Engels and Marsh wrote letters to over here in the United States, grandson of Sorge that for some reason Hitler didn't know the connection and had given him a job in the Nazi apparatus and he was in Japan and he got the exact date and sent it to Moscow. What the exact date? And somebody else got the exact date too. And Stalin said, oh no, that couldn't be. We have this pact for 10 years, you know, and we're okay, you don't have to worry, and so forth and so on. So then when Hitler marched in and practically took almost to the gates of Moscow and Leningrad, uh, they turned that into the genius of Stalin that he lured Hitler in. Lured Hitler in at the cost of about 10 or 12 million people killed. But anyway, Khrushchev, uh, Khrushchev exposed all this, exposed some of these terrible things, and showed how, uh, and he exaggerated too. He said that Stalin was afraid and he hid under the table and all these things, you know. Whereas Trotsky said that Stalin could look danger straight in the eye. Trotsky never attacked Stalin for being a coward and so forth and so on. And it's hard to believe that a man who started out as, a, as strong as Stalin was, that his problem was not personal cowardice. But the fact that Khrushchev attacked him as a personal coward just showed that Khrushchev was looking for more and more things to attack him with. It's also important, by the way, to remember that in this whole attack, Khrushchev never attacked Stalin for anything he did in conciliating with the United States or conciliating with England. He attacked Stalin for the way he fought Hitler, knowing that Hitler was also the enemy of the United States. <coughs> In other words, Khrushchev was aiming for a pact with the United States, and he was aiming to please U.S. imperialism. So all his criticisms of Stalin, every one practically, was a criticism which not only would, be, would uh, affect the loyalty of the CP, that wasn't really what he was out to do. He wasn't out to crush the U.S. CP, although it practically did it, what he was out to do was make a gesture in the direction of U.S. imperialism. So he never accused Stalin of selling out the world revolution. He didn't accuse Stalin of all the things that Trotsky accused him of. He didn't accuse Stalin of, of, uh, of letting Hitler come to power or something like that. Or he didn't accuse Stalin of not fighting to the end in the various revolutions or advising, he didn't accuse Stalin of advising the CPs, you know, to support U.S. imperialism, like I said in the first lecture. I, he, didn't, he didn't accuse them of taking the wrong line in World War II or anything like that. See, Khrushchev didn't do that. So we brought this out to the SWP. We said, well, look, he hasn't really criticized Stalin. I mean, not from the left. We didn't put it that way at that time because it, it hit so suddenly, you know, I'm, I'm having some of the advantage of hindsight in some of the things I'm saying. I'm not saying we said everything like this at that time, but we did not join with the SWP's giddiness about how wonderful this was and how democratic it's going to be for the workers. Mind you, they didn't say capitalist democracy. They said it's going to be workers' democracy now. It's going to be real socialism now. It's going to be genuine communism now in the Soviet Union. That was their line. And that Khrushchev is the first step 
towards genuine communism. That was their line. Now, as a result of this, the secret speech coming out, there was another exodus, a much bigger exodus than there had been in February, of the CP. And every single one of these CPers that left, outside of maybe a dozen or half a dozen, uh, went to the right. They went to the bourgeoisie. And we told the SWP, because I was more than they were interested in this, and went to all the meetings, the public meetings that the CP had, I said, these people are not going to the left. And I considered the SWP to the left at that time. They're not going to our direction. They're going to go to the bourgeoisie. And the SWP said, oh, but that's because you're Stalinist. That's because you think that anybody that opposes Stalin and Stalinism is automatically going to the right. I said, no, I don't think they're automatically going to the right. I think they are going to the right. <laughs> These people happen to be going to the right. But the way they, they thought like they said I thought, like they said we thought. And they thought that these people that were quitting would all be good candidates for the S to join the SWP. Now, you've got to remember that SWP, at that time, there can be an argument how far left it really was or how far right it really was, but it still was in the workers' movement, and these people weren't interested, even with it stopping for a, a, a way station, even for a, a lunch period break. They weren't going to stop to see the SWP. They were too much in a hurry to get back and be accepted again. They, they, and of course, they had struggled. Many of these CPers had struggled and had stood up against the witch hunt and all of that, but they had used up all of their strength in doing this. So when these revelations came and hurt them the way it did, the way the, way the revelations did, they weren't about to start all over again, embracing a theory new to them that had formerly been hateful to them and then the SWP didn't know how to handle it. They didn't come up to them and say, look, we're the real communists. They didn't say that, which would have been the correct way to say, well, look, we've been with you all this time. We understand, you know, and so forth. We understand what you really wanted. You really wanted communism. Well, okay, we're going to fight for communism too. Oh, no. They come in and said, well, this proves we were right. Stalin was a bum all the time, and he was a killer and a murderer and so forth. And I should add one more point that Khrushchev brought out on, on his murders that really was devastating and no answer to it. And that was that in the, he said that in the Congress of the Victors, the Victors against Trotsky, and the left opposition, in 1934, the Congress of the Victors had around 2,000 and something people. In 1939, this same Congress was reduced to one third. Two thirds had been killed. By whom? By Stalin by Stalin's orders. Now, at that time, nobody dared criticize it. But in 1956, three years after Stalin's death, mind you, three years after his death, Khrushchev let it out, and everybody knew it was true. He let it knew it was true. But it was so devastating. It was so devastating. So horrifying, to, especially to somebody who always worshipped Stalin, that you, you just couldn't tell. You. Here, here's this little party telling you, well, look, we told you so. We told you so. We told you Stalin was a bum, you know. Well, how could that attract anybody, especially when they were so terrible? It, it could have attracted some, very few, but some, if they, I mean, they, if the SWP had done it right, I mean, had done it from a revolutionary point of view, they might have got somebody, but they didn't. Now, I might also say that the leader of the SWP at that time, James Buchanan, came up with a, this thesis. He said, well, Khrushchev did this because he was forced to by the Soviet working class. That the Soviet working class uh, was so appalled by Stalin. In other words, the revolutionary Soviet working class uh, realized that Stalin was counter-revolutionary. And they were pushing for a new deal. And Khrushchev, although he was brought up in the Stalin school, this is all according to the SWP, although he was brought up in the Stalin school himself, he had to open the door to a little workers' democracy, a little real communism, and he had to make the first step 
of what they called the political revolution, the SWP called. Now, what's the political revolution? Trotsky had said, after 1933, if you remember that was the time Hitler took power, and the time he thought that the Communist International was done for, in 1933, he said, look, this Stalin is so bad that we've got to change him for another leader. And it, it can't be done democratically anymore because it's impossible. The Communist Party of the Soviet Union is so completely uh, militarized and run by the police that the only thing you can do is, is shove them out with force. But it can't be a social revolution because that would upset communism. You've got to have a political revolution that is like in the old-fashioned South American revolutions where on the same social basis, you have a new personnel put in. See? So we've got to put a new personnel, you know, in and get rid of Stalin. That would be a political revolution. Trotsky added, however, under present conditions, this was in 1934, when conditions were politically, in a way, better. <coughs> At least there was a lot more memories of Lenin and memories of genuine Bolshevism in 1934. But even with those memories, <clears throat> there was not enough that was so heavy, the reaction was so heavy, as the Stalinist reaction was so heavy, that if there was a political revolution now, he said, in 1934, it would just help the social counter-revolution. It would go in a right-wing direction. Now, the SWP will never mention that. See, they never mention that. They only see it that this political revolution will solve everything, and they're not worried whether it's going to go to the left or the right, just as you're seeing now in the question of Poland. Here's a political and social counter-revolution taking place, and they claim it's a left-wing revolution to the left, right? That's going to restore genuine communism, so they say. Or so they say they think, if they don't even, I don't even think they think it. Uh, now, in the middle of this, situation in 56, with the SWP digging themselves in deeper and deeper and saying that this is the beginning of the political revolution, a political revolution started. And it was a counter-revolution, and they got themselves so dug in that they regarded the counter-revolution as the communist political revolution. And it started in Poland. <coughs> now, Poland was very unclear because of a number of things that I won't go into, but at that time, there was some little decollectivization in Poland in 56, but it seemed like there was a lot of leftist developments in Poland too. It seemed like it was very mixed up in Poland. But in retrospect, it's very easy to see that it was a big move to the right in Poland, especially when you see that was when the deal was made with the Catholic Church and so forth, and Gomulka, although Gomulka had been in jail under the Nazis, and he was in jail under Stalin and so forth, but he was, and he was a genuine communist and all that. That was, this, that was the Polish leader, Polish CP leader. But nevertheless, it was a step backwards in some respects, a big step backwards. But the thing that was clear, and the thing that became the big, big turning point, the thing that jolted the CP to pieces and practically pulverized it, was the Hungarian uprising of October, November 1956. Now, why did it pulverize the CP? Well, because apparently it was fighting for some kind of democracy. And they had been educated to believe that all the Eastern countries and the Soviet Union were all democratic as hell. And the people, you know, were asking for democracy and this and that. And apparently at first, not capitalist democracy. They had had a, uh, a leader named Rakosi in Hungary who was very dictatorial, very bureaucratic and so forth and so on. And uh, was very much uh, in the Stalin mold and so forth and so on. And he did many things wrong and the people were sore at him. So when the uprising came, and it was encouraged, no doubt about it, by Khrushchev and the Khrushchev revelation, it was encouraged by that. 
Now, so the SWP, who had already taken the position that these revelations are all going to the left in the direction of genuine communism, the minute that the uprising started in Poland, they said, oh, here the workers are fighting for communism, for real communism, for a rebirth, for a renaissance, you know, for Leninism, and so forth and so on. And uh, we hesitated at first, but we noticed one thing was sure, that the bourgeoisie liked it. Now, of course, sometimes the bourgeoisie can be mistaken. But the bourgeoisie was giddy about it. And every single magazine and every single newspaper, and there was about seven newspapers in New York at that time, and every single edition of every newspaper was so full of the glorious revolution in Hungary. It was so wonderful, they said. And the SWP was saying it was wonderful too. So we said, no, there's got to be something. So we examined it, read books that these guys that were in there put out, did us all in a few days and everything, and, and read every word that was taking place and everything, and we said, Oh, this is a counter-revolution. Even though it uses socialist language, and it used more than the Poles are using today, and the Polish solidarity and so forth, and it wasn't joining with the Catholic Church and everything, although it did let Mincendi out of jail. Not in an organized way, apparently in an unorganized way, and apparently accidentally, that Mincendi was the cardinal, just like uh, Wyszynski was in Poland, and this new guy, Glemp, is going to be the cardinal. And, and, and a cardinal who had a job that was like a medieval job called the primate. It's like uh, Cardinal Richelieu had in France or something. I mean, it's something way out. Something no self-respecting capitalist country would have. But they, that's what they had over there. And this guy was getting back in somehow. But that was only one of the things. They were, they had the, the very last two or three days of the uprising, there was a unleashed an anti-Semitic furor. In, in, uh, in Hungary. And, and that, pre everybody pretended not to notice. It was only in a one or two little places. The SWP never mentioned it. And uh, in addition to that, the peasants all walked off the collectives and stole the farm machinery. And the richer ones getting more machinery for themselves and so forth. Oh, but that wasn't important. That wasn't important. The important thing was that they were overthrowing these Stalinist dictators and they were going to have you know, the workers, and they, workers had councils, workers' councils, Soviets. Workers' council is merely the word, the English word for Soviet, right? So they, they had Soviets in Hungary. Only trouble was these Soviets were going in the right-wing direction. Just because they're a workers' council does not automatically make them communist. These workers' councils, as we pointed out, uh, the Red Army came in on November the 4th, for instance, 1956. And it overthrew the government that the counter-revolution had elected. Now, this government was led by a right-wing communist named Naj, somewhat like Bukharin in uh, the Soviet Union, but he was a communist. The only trouble was, being a right-wing communist, he was weak. And he invited into his government Social Democrats and a smallholders party, both of which were capitalist parties. And they were in the majority in his government, and the communist members, com communist party members, were in a minority. And it was called a popular front government. And the CP over here, who had been educated to think popular front government is great, it's democratic and everything, they were horrified to see that this government was the government that the Soviet army crushed. And of course, the bourgeoisie was horrified too. Somebody had to be wrong. You know. But anyway, the uh, SWP said, that these Soviets, you know, they said after we put them to the wall on the character of this government, lining up every single person and showing the record and so forth, showing this is a capitalist government. And the SWP was always the one that was criticizing the popular front governments of the CP for being capitalist. Well, this is capitalist, a capitalist popular, popular front. They said, well, maybe you're right, but the point is that the workers are in these Soviets, and it was the Soviets that the Red Army disbanded too. They forgot one thing, that these workers, Soviets so-called, were calling for the reinstatement of this government. They weren't calling for Soviets to power, like the Soviets in Russia in 1917. They were calling for the reinstatement of this capitalist popular front government, the Nodge government. 
and they had an 18-day general strike, which was very tough and very tough to oppose a general strike like that, an 18-day strike, and that was before the developments in Poland that now we're a little more familiar with. It was very hard to do that. We had to stand up against our own party, against the CP, against all the bourgeoisie and petty bourgeoisie and all the other parties. It was very difficult to maintain the position that this is a reactionary government and the Red Army is making a progressive move by overthrowing it and putting in the Qadar government. And that was the situation at that time. Now, as I said, there were problems. The fact that there was a general strike, the fact that the workers had genuine grievances against this guy Rakosi, and that he was a Stalinist type, and that he was an unthinking bureaucratic dictator, and that he was running around in a limousine when the workers didn't have bicycles. And that was very tough for the workers and everything. So, I, I, you know, to try to, you know, imagine that it's not that easy. It's very easy for people, you know, the sectarians to say, oh, this is Stalinist, or this is Trotskyist, or this is the... But in living politics, in the living class struggle, you know, you've got to stand up against realities and struggle for a real program, you know. But the SWP, like the CP in its way, just had their little thing, their little factional thing that they're pushing, and they were stuck with their theory of the political revolution, and they, what's so called, and they really crossed the Rubicon when, after we showed them what it really was, they decided that they're going to stick with it. I might to give you a couple of little personal experiences. Sam was still in Buffalo, but we were on the phone all the time. I was in New York, and I was attended all the political committee meetings and so forth, and at one moment, I, uh, I went in to the national secretary or acting secretary or something, and I said, look, hold up. Don't print the military this way. Don't print it until you find out what's really happening. I read it, but don't print it. Well, what do you mean? What do you, mean? you know, this is what you think it is. This is a counter-revolution. Well, we've never missed an issue. We can't miss an issue with the paper. I said, but isn't it more important to be right? Even if we miss an issue, let's have a discussion on it. Well, we'll have a discussion, but we've got to come out. Well, of course, once they <clears throat> come out, that kind of crystallized opinion in the party, in the leadership, and in New York, and especially crystallized opinion, it was that ten times harder to argue against them. No, but they really, uh, oh yes, and, and, and in, at the end of one of the meetings, one of their leaders said, um, gee, if we took your position, and he said it with a little note in his voice, too. He said, that would be political suicide. Well, I should have had the, the, uh, the, thought, the quick thought to say, yeah, but in the long run, you're just making real slow suicide. I mean, better to, uh, that was his real motive. His real motive in taking the other position was he was afraid of being alone. He was afraid that he might be killed politically. And one of the things about revolutionary politics is when you have to take an unpopular position, you try not to, try very hard to put our position in popular form like we're doing now. But when you have to take an unpopular position, you've got to face it. You know, if you can't face the unpopular position and you can't stand up when things are going bad, then you won't be able to fight the fight through when things are going good. It's like a tug of war. When people are tugging your heart out, if you can't stand there and take it, then you're not going to be able to, to come back and tug the other way. You'll just be take, swept off your feet. And that's what they were. They were really swept off their feet. And it was the final step, really, of their degeneration because they took the other side of the barricade. But even then, it was the leadership that was the worst. The uh, the, uh, the rank and file of the SWP, I think even then, a lot of them could have been won over to a revolutionary position had the leadership had the guts to, you know, stand up. But, as I said, they'd, first of all, they had already dug themselves in, 
committed themselves on this political revolution thesis. And don't forget they had spread that around a lot, too, and gotten everybody's hopes up that things were going to be so good in the Soviet Union. And there were people, a lot of people outside of the SWB who were saying, oh, yeah, they're going to rehabilitate Trotsky now and so forth, see? because it seemed they rehabilitated Bukharin and I think Zinoviev, I'm not sure, or we're going to, are talking about rehabilitating them. One of the things Khrushchev said was, well, you know, all those Moscow trials, you know, those people were really, uh, he didn't say they were innocent, but he said they were political opponents. And it was the truth. It was Lenin's whole Central Committee. Lenin's whole Central Committee was killed by Stalin. Lenin never got around to killing him. Stalin had to do it in time of peace. And Lenin went through the revolution, the civil war, everything. Stalin did all this. See? So as far as that goes, Khrushchev was right. But anyway, having said this, it appeared to people that didn't really figure out what the motives of all this was and where Khrushchev was really heading, it appeared to a lot of fairly political people that, well, well, gee, maybe, maybe Trotsky will do a comeback. Maybe, you know, they're going to be more rational in the Soviet Union. And they're going to, you know, that wasn't what it was about. Now, <clears throat> now let me just leave that, just to repeat, and just end on discussion of the Chinese. Now, you're all familiar, or most of you are familiar with the fact that the general political movement as we know it have talked about Khrushchev revisionism. But this was long after the 20th Congress, long after 1956. I mean, that was really beginning as early as you can possibly make it from 1962, but really much later. Say from 1962 to 1975, there was a lot of talk about Khrushchev revisionism. But it was most loud from about 1968 or 9 to 1975 in, in the American movement. Now, what was the Chinese CP attitude? They supported Khrushchev. This is very important. From 1956 to 1960 in particular, and silently maybe till 62. They supported Khrushchev. They had, when Khrushchev came out, with his coexistence program and everything, it coincided exactly with what the Chinese CP wanted. They had been having a coexistence program, peaceful coexistence and so forth and so on. And they came out further and said, let a hundred flowers bloom, which meant at that time, let a hundred schools of thought contend. And we're not gonna have, you know, any, uh, you know, tough dictatorship. But unfortunately, the hundred schools of thought they were talking about that didn't mean leftism, that meant rightism. It meant all sorts of different oppositions to communism. That's what really the hundred schools of thought. So when they chopped down these flowers, that was good. That meant it moved to the left. Even if it was somewhat Stalinist in quotes, it was a move to the left. Now, in 1960 approximately, you probably know that Khrushchev, the Khrushchev leadership, withdrew all the blueprints, all the technicians, all the engineers, and all the aid the Soviet Union was giving China. From 56 to 60, Khrushchev and the Soviets gave massive, tremendous aid to China. And people forget that. Gave tremendous aid to China. And one of the reasons they went along with Khrushchev was because Khrushchev was given such tremendous aid to China. Although it also coincided with their own opinions to some extent, it, they also wanted to have that ally, that alliance with the Soviet Union. But there was a big quarrel between Khrushchev and Mao Zedong in 1960, right after Khrushchev had made a trip to see Eisenhower, the President of the United States. Nobody knows exactly what was said. But the likelihood is that Khrushchev made some agreement or tentative agreement with Eisenhower over the head of Mao Zedong without consulting Mao Zedong and then told him about it afterward and Mao exploded. And from that time on, the Chinese were bringing up the question of the Siberian lands that had belonged to the old Chinese empire that the Tsar had taken away from the emperors. And Lenin had more or less said they would give back. And that became a tremendous issue, and that was part of the quarrel, too. 
So all this took place between 1956 and 60. In 1962, the, they began, they opened up the first shot in the ideological quarrel with Khrushchev. Now mind you, that's six years, over six years after the 20th Congress. That's important for us to understand. It would be anyway if we were still talking with the Mao groupings and so forth. Important to understand and understanding how the Chinese leadership arrived at their various positions. That after six years, they began their ideological struggle and we were for them in the ideological struggle. But it was after six years. And then they rehabilitated Stalin. They didn't used to before 1962 or three have pictures of Stalin around in China? No, 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 they put them up in 1962 or 1963, long, long after the Chinese Revolution, long, long after the 20th Congress of 1956, they had the great big pictures of Marx, Lenin, Engels, and Stalin. Suddenly, you know, where, where is this guy coming from? Well, there was a reason. Maybe they were for Stalin's politics, but Everything you read in Peking Review before that, you know, from 1956 on, not only agreed with Khrushchev, but hit Stalin for not being attentive to small countries, to colonial countries, and so forth, and for being too insensitive, you know, to the needs of colonial countries. But all of a sudden, he was the greatest. Well, there was a reason. One of the, the first biggest and most obvious reasons why they wanted to rehabilitate Stalin was that there was two factions in the Soviet Union. There was the Khrushchev faction and there was the Stalin faction, even after Stalin's death. Molotov and Kaganovich, who had been on the Central Committee, on the Politburo, you know, <coughs> along with Zhukov and a couple of other big leaders, to some extent Mikoyan, who was another one, were still support more or less they were the remains of the old Stalin grouping. The Chinese at the time were still calling for, and, and more calling for world revolution, infinitely more than Khrushchev was, and, and helping the left wing of the communist parties throughout the world, or wanting to, and trying to get them on their side. The Chinese also needed the, to resume the alliance with the Soviet Union. How could they do it? Well, if they couldn't do it with Khrushchev, maybe they could do it with the faction opposed to Khrushchev. And who was that faction? That faction was the so-called Stalin faction, the so-called anti-party faction that, that uh, Mao Zedong and Zhao Enlai and the rest had condemned in 1956. Now they decided they were good, and they wanted to get them on their side. This anti-party faction, so unquote, this anti-party faction was nothing else but the remains of the Stalin grouping that was opposed to Khrushchev. So Mao and the Chinese leadership made an overture to this faction. And part of their overture was to say Stalin was good. Okay. That period lasted for a few years, from 1962 or three, until approximately 68 or nine, maybe 70, when all that period, they said how great Stalin was and put out, you know, Stalin's picture all over the world and everything. And then, of course, they invented the social imperialism theory of the Soviet Union, you know. Well, that meant they were approaching the U.S., the Chinese leadership was approaching the U.S. And even under Mao, although Mao wasn't so enthusiastic about it, they were approaching the U.S. somewhat. And they were talking about social imperialism in the Soviet Union. And they were beginning to drop Stalin. Finally, Mao practically buried Stalin again in his interview with uh, Han Su Yin, who wrote Morning Deluge and other books, a woman who, of great talent in novels and so forth, and, and said in, in it that Stalin never helped this and hurt this Chinese revolution and so forth and so on. But it was all, you see, much of it anyway, was on a nationalist basis on the basis of the national needs of China, just like Khrushchev and Stalin before him, based themselves on the national needs of the Soviet Union. Now, we are for 
the Soviet Union as a nation, we're for China as a nation, we know that there are countries that need to have international diplomacy, they need to make various compromises, they need to, you know, stay afloat as country. But they are also revolutionary countries, and their leaders are pushed and pulled and are not free as we are. They're not as free as we are to be for the revolution, say, in the United States or something, because they have to pay for that. They're not going to get any trade with the United States if they come out openly and so forth. See? So they, then they change, they change their line. You know? And so somebody who is very revolutionary for a little while, like the Chinese leaders were for a while, then they are not revolutionary for a while. And we have to try to understand that too. I'm, I'm giving this, of course, a whole sweep uh, when I'm summing up. And if you haven't followed all this, don't worry about it because there's been many talks and many struggles on all of these things that I've discussed, you know. And I've only tried to give a continuity of, of thought, or rather of events, and some thought, about what happened around 1956 and how it's, why it's still echoing today, the things that happened in 56, and how the wrong positions that were taken by various groups in 1956 are still being paid for and are still being continued in different ways, you know? And, but that's part of our heritage that we had those struggles in 56 and later in connection with whether it was Khrushchev or Stalin, or Mao, or, or Lin Piao, or somebody else, Chiang, Chiang Ching, and so on, in China, that, uh, that these things were all interconnected. And you can't examine one thing completely without examining the other things that were part of that same continuity. So I'll end it there. and. Uh,